to Psychedelics today. It's David here having a conversation with Saga Briggs, the author of How to Change Your Body, The Science of Interoception and Healing Through Connection to Yourself and Others. Uh, and you're in Berlin, you're, it's 1.30 in the afternoon. What does life feel like in your body, in your world at the moment? Hmm, great question. Uh, feels grounded, yeah. Um, feels very connected. I'm glad to be here with you in this moment. Um, I'm glad to be in a great city in the world. Hmm. Awesome. Welcome. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this chat, Saga. There's uh, there's so much in your book that that I want to kind of reread, and I've I dived in, and um, yeah, I, I'm sure we're gonna have tons to talk about. But before we jump into the book itself, I'm curious just to hear a bit more about you as a as a person. Um, so before you got to Berlin uh, six years ago, yeah, can you just paint a wee picture about like who you who you were and what life was like and kind of the, some of the different journeys that yeah you've been on prior to uh, arriving in Berlin yeah yeah so it was quite the journey um, I grew up in Oregon in the Pacific Northwest in the U.S. Um, and became a journalist became a freelance writer about 10 years ago actually in 2013 um, and was really involved in writing about educational psychology. So most of my work has been in that, in that vein. Um, and spent many years managing a publication that connected teachers and students with the latest science in educational psychology. Um, and that job actually took me around the world. So I did a lot of traveling between uh, living in Oregon and moving to Berlin um working remotely as a freelance writer so uh yeah there's quite a lot of time um between leaving the u.s and arriving in berlin where i was kind of just uh yeah exploring different cultures um experiencing a lot and yeah upon arriving in berlin i kind of felt in my body that it was the right place to be. I knew that something magical would happen here. It was sort of this open feeling um, that I had to spend more time. And that has turned out to be correct. It's been like a really amazing journey over the past six years. Mm. Yeah, decision, ma decision making is a tricky thing. And it's uh, how do we know that we're making the right choice? before we can kind of look back on it and, and get hindsight and yeah what, what is even the right choice and is there such a thing as a wrong choice and yeah I think I've been speaking to quite a lot of people lately and, and kind of the wisdom of the body when we're truly kind of tuned in is helpful um, just for knowing that the decision making process is yeah we're really kind of meeting it and uh, kind of doing it justice and we're making decisions all the time about how we feel how we react to things and I'm wondering uh your relationship with your body, what kind of a journey have you been on in your attunement to that? We're going to be talking a lot about kind of interoception and embodiment. So maybe a good thing to do is talk about like what that is. If you, if you can give some of your own kind of, yeah, explanations of like embodiment, interoception, and then also talking through in your journey of relationship to your own body, how has that kind of evolved over time? Yeah, so just a basic definition of interoception would be the sense of the body from within, um, which sounds very simple, but I think actually a lot of people don't realize that that is a process in and of itself. Um, so detecting anything from hunger and thirst to emotions in the body to uh, feeling that something is really right or really wrong in your life. All of those things could count as interoception. Um, and yeah, it's something that we use every day, whether we're aware of it or not, to make decisions, like you said. Um, and in some ways, it's a different process than making a decision rationally, you know, using your more cognitive mind um, to navigate life. 
And I've, I've found this just to be a fascinating process personally over the past six years of tuning into that sense and experimenting with it. Um, and just in terms of decision making, for example, I mean, yes, I think that some of the best decisions I've ever made in my life that have led to the best, most fulfilling things have been non-rational, tuning into the wisdom of the body, um, just trusting that it will be the right decision. Uh, and that said, I think that sometimes you can be wrong. Um, you know, sometimes you may think that you have a feeling of, of wanting to move towards a decision and later on you find out it was the wrong decision, uh, but that's data as well. So I think that it's a long process over time of kind of picking up on your own patterns and connecting feelings to decisions um, to really, yeah, connect with with what's true for you. Hmm. Yeah, and on a collective level, there's definitely a parallel between on, you know, individually, we are very much in our own brains, in our heads, but as a society, in our kind of, I think our cultural um, era that we're in is very much, you know, intellectual, intellectual and kind of hyper technological and yeah, just not slow and embodied and connected and integrated and yeah, transcending time and space in a way, which I think, um, our body enables us to do to simply be like beings and human beings and uh, every body and any body. I'm just playing with words, but you know, ultimately, I, I'm just there's so much about us. I think collectively that we've lost uh, around having bodies and being beings that simply be. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know to what extent that came out in your book, but how are you understanding that kind of more collective cultural? phenomena of us on a societal level being in a sense disembodied and then on the individual level also being disembodied and the kind of the yeah the interrelationship between them yeah i love that you point to that because i think we're in a very interesting moment in time collectively i think it, it almost feels like a great awakening to our bodies uh, as a society and we've been asleep for a very long time. Um, some, some would say since Descartes, you know, since the uh, Cartesian, I think therefore I am kind of philosophy came into place. Um, yeah, we don't want to blame everything on Descartes, but yeah, I think we've just been in a, a very brain based cognitive space for a really long time. Um, and just now, neuroscience is starting to kind of connect more with brain-body interactions. You know, it's not so much focused on the brain, but uh, the interoception research is highlighting that, that it's a two-way street between brain and body. Um, so, yeah, we have this, this really interesting thread going in neuroscience and the clinical literature that's kind of... Uh, pointing us towards the body, but then also we're hearing so much about somatics in psychedelics and the psychedelic world as well. Um, and of course, Bessel van der Kolk's book, Body Keeps the Score, really resonates with people. Uh, I mean, it, it has, you know, since the pandemic and before. So I think, I think we're witnessing kind of a, a shift at the moment. But I would say, you know, the shift always begins within, like within the individual. That's a good place to start. Hmm. Yeah, and your, your book's awesome because it's got the section at the end looking at the practical pieces of what people can do in, in their own life to become more embodied and to have that yeah ongoing relationship with their body. Uh, so it's not theoretical because it can't be because we're talking about you know our body so it can't just be thinking about it and reading about it like we have to do something um, or just be something um, that enables us to do that and the body's a beautiful thing like I, I honestly feel like that there's maybe some kind of religious ideology uh, that's we've been infected by on a societal level like the body being like 
impure it's going to kind of lead us astray there's this kind of evil nature around the sensual body and um you know it has to control it by the mind and i think that is yeah a lot of the the illnesses that we have is just you know for me personally i have ocd and i think that has been a, a hyper control function in my life to try and protect me but also it's meant i've been disembodied for quite a lot of my life um and so i think unpacking that is is that healing piece is is yeah re-embodying and I'd, I'd you know love to know if what experiences have helped you in your kind of re-embodiment but for me i have found really helps with with my own embodiment is yoga every day especially when the kids are not there at home in the living room um getting that quiet bit of time is amazing because i listen to drum and bass music all day long <laughs> uh, and i drink coffee which is the worst thing for me but i love it i'm probably addicted and i just need it or i feel like i need it i like to believe that i need it and that without it i wouldn't reach my potential so there's an interesting relationship there i need to to work on um, but yeah just the idea of embodiment and you know my experiences with ocd as well i think i have created a an obstacle to being embodied that it has made me less embodied um, as a protective mechanism. And I think quite a lot of what you've said in your book as well is around the disembodiment or the disconnection between mind and body um, is a powerful causation or, or correlation between that and mental illness of different types, eating disorders, you know, depression, anxiety that you mentioned as well. Um, so I'm wondering for you in your journeys and current journey around uh, embodiment interoception. What are some of your practices that you do, kind of on a on a regular basis? And then, any particular practices you might kind of call in when you really need to say, "Hey, I've got to kind of amplify my ability to really connect and with how I'm feeling right now." So you do do those as and when needed. Yeah, um, something that really helped for me early on was Reiki. Um, I actually, I don't think I really shifted into a more embodied space until I started practicing Reiki in 2020. Um, before that, I, I knew I was disconnected a bit, um, was aware of it, but I wasn't sure what the issue is. Like, okay, I'm disconnected. How do I become more connected? And through Reiki, I kind of learned that the issue was body trust, really trusting my body um, in any situation, really, to kind of regulate itself and bring itself back to homeostasis if there's a stress there in the environment. Um, I think before that, I sort of thought, okay, I just have to be in a good mood. I have to get enough sleep. I have to was sort of like mind over matter um, kind of mentality, uh, you know, have to be in the right mental place and then my body will, will kind of follow after that. And the shift that I made through Reiki was, no, actually you can trust your body in each moment, moment to moment on a continual basis um, to send you signals that are information which you can use or you can not use, but to cultivate this relationship of respect for whatever does come up, whatever you are feeling, um, and kind of just be aware of all of it, I think is really powerful, really transformative. So, yeah, I mean, I've developed this practice of kind of just continually being aware of whatever is going on even when nothing's going on and it's completely boring blank slate um and my body like that's that's also a place of potential resourcing um you know this kind of calm grounded state so i would say i mean there are particular practices like reiki um mindfulness meditation of course but really the thing that has helped me the most is trust and respect like just kind of shifting the relationship i have with my internal state um and yeah and, and it's it's interesting because body trust is actually um a facet of interoception so people study 
interoception scientifically, and there are different facets of it. You can break it down to self-regulation, emotion regulation, body listening, um, and body trust is kind of one of these measures that's super closely tied to various psychiatric disorders. So people who uh, develop eating disorders, um, people who have suicidal ideation, um, OCD in some cases, tend to have diminished body trust, which the scientific, scientific definition is like feeling at home in your body, feeling your body is a safe place, feeling you can trust your, your sensations. Um, and that in particular, that facet seems to be uh, dysregulated for a lot of people with these disorders. And what you were just talking about there, Saga, is that what you mentioned in the book as the MAIA scale you were referring to there? Yeah. The yeah, it's the multi, yeah, multidimensional assessment of inter interoceptive awareness. Yeah. And there's there's a lot of questions there, like 36 questions, was it? Yeah, yeah. So the scale is included in the book. Yeah. And you can you can rate yourself, uh, take the test. It's normally used... Um, yeah, in studies uh, to kind of measure people's interceptive awareness clinically, but you can you can take the quiz yourself and rate yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah, and before we dive into uh, the book, you just said something around the you know sometimes your body's a blank slate and that you're tuning into that's what it is. Is that the same thing as what you've spoken about around homeostasis? And, and what is the importance of homeostasis and is it being with the body however it's feeling, whether it's feeling tense? Is that homeostasis or is, is, is it, does it mean there's, there's pleasant feelings in the body? Mm, that's a really great question. Yeah, because homeostasis, I think, is normally defined as um, being in a state of enoughness or contentment or feeling safe um, but it's really easy to then jump from from that to if I'm not feeling safe or calm all the time then something is wrong so yeah I think that's a bit tricky like to not kind of um, yeah sort of talk down to yourself if you are having a stressful moment but to stay you know in relationship uh, and caring relationship with whatever you are feeling. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you bring up homeostasis because one thing I, I write about in the book, which I find really interesting, is that the neuroscience research is kind of moving in this direction of prioritizing the body in the sense that, yeah, it's sort of like a, a shift from thinking that... Um, the body just responds to the brain, shifting from that to actually the brain evolved in service of the body and, and to regulate the body and maintain homeostasis. Um, and so neuroscientists like Anil Seth would say that um, consciousness evolved to serve the body and that it has more to do with being alive than being intelligent which I think is a fascinating idea um, and connects really nicely with somatics because somatics are all about, you know, aliveness, wholeness and serving the body. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's a really exciting time. Um, neuroscience is sort of merging with biology in this way that we haven't seen uh, until recently. Yeah, I think so the psychedelic world is definitely at the forefront of this more integrative discipline you know that brings together different ways of understanding or just learning about what it is to have a body and the different systems in the body it's it's there's so much more than just the brain and the, I think as a mental health practitioner you know I got really disillusioned with just diagnoses and and medicines you know medications um, that didn't really work because it's they weren't truly helping people get to the source of what was going on, which is often kind of in the body, you know, as Bessel van der Kolk was saying, you know, he doesn't actually believe that the 
PTSD diagnosis that he helped to design actually exists and it can it might not be so helpful to to obsess with that um so i want to dive into the book splash there we go the book came after you moved to berlin in 2018 so can you just talk us through like once you unpacked your bags in berlin and kind of got into life there what what happened and and where did the genesis for the book kind of come from that this was something that you needed to um yeah express and and put out there so I had been writing about mental health and psychology for a while. Um, so I kind of had the professional interest already, but it wasn't until I moved to Berlin in 2018 that my personal healing journey kind of became um, kind of accelerated, I should say. And I had had some issues with substance dependence myself in the past and was kind of working through that and working through a lot of anxiety. And I, I found that like upon moving to Berlin and kind of connecting with the city um, and life here, I found that the things that helped me were very embodied and very relational. And at the same time, I started thinking like, okay, we're calling these, these illnesses mental illnesses, but maybe there's a bit more to it than the mental aspect. Um, and yeah, so I, I, I just discovered the interoception literature at some point and it just clicked for me. I thought, okay, this has been, this aligns with my personal journey, um, but it also aligns with kind of embodied cognition and where the research is heading. Um, and that was also the same year that Michael Pollan's book came out and psychedelic research kind of uh, started taking off into, into main, the mainstream awareness. And I also started thinking about psychedelics in a more embodied way. So um, yeah, it, it all just kind of became just like a passionate interest of mine and I could not stop researching and writing about it and it was like yeah like two desires to kind of share this and and educate the public but also heal myself at the same time so I think it was it was very personally driven but also um, especially upon discovering the interoception literature I thought I have to share this with people this is too important not to share um, and I wrote an article for the Mind Foundation in 2020 that was about interoception in a social context. And that was actually kind of the early seeds of the book. Um, and I just realized I had a lot more to say <laughs> after that. You know, one article wasn't enough. So that's where, you know, um, contacting all the people that I interviewed for the book that's where that came in and it just kind of snowballed from there. Awesome. Yeah. I, I uh, looked through that article. It's amazing. So you wrote it in 2020 uh, for the mind foundation. The article is called social interoception, the case for treating mental illnesses through the body in a social setting. Um, yeah. And I just love that you found something that you loved so much that you just want to keep writing and learning and talking and interviewing people. That must feel amazing. Um, just to like, wow, to just go deep and deeper into it. And it's, it's a really personal piece as well. And, um, the, the title of the book is awesome. Um, it's, yeah, I, I'm really interested to hear like, why, why did you give it that title in particular? I, you know, after the Michael Pollan one, how to change your mind. Yeah, I think it was like a, an early title that was a joke, you know, like I thought, oh, you know, it'd be funny to kind of add a playful nod to Michael Pollan's book. And then it just stuck. I never changed it. <laughs> um, but it also, yeah, I think it speaks to the moment that we're in um, related to what I said before about neuroscience and biology merging and, uh, you know, realizing that the self is embodied um, and even the brain is part of the body, the mind is part of the body. Um, it's a two-way street. There's 
bi-directional interaction going on that can't be ignored. Um, so yeah, it's an attempt to kind of like continue moving into this more embodied space. And uh, yeah, um, I'm glad that, that it resonates with you. Yeah, um, I, I love it, the title, because in a sense, you know, it's a nod to Michael Pollan's book, but I think it's also an evolution from it. And I think, you know, the whole how to change your mind is still coming from that paradigm of us being, you know, walking, talking brains. Um, and I think the whole field of neuroscience and um, kind of neuropsychology and neuroplasticity are all amazing. But I still think they're just very limited and they, they aren't kind of sufficient to truly encapsulate, express, understand what it is to be alive, what what psychedelics are and how they work. And so I feel like, yeah, maybe that how to change your mind is in a sense coming from the old paradigm a bit more like it from a, a masculine lens, you know, very intellectual and thinking. Whereas, yeah, how to change your body embodiment kind of being grounded and really yeah anchored within yourself and and connecting with others through that is more feminine and and honestly that is the direction we need to move in over the next few centuries <laughs> um so uh, yeah I, I really feel like it's kind of it, it, it's, it's i love what you did there basically and i think it's really really important that we we don't just get obsessed with the mind and neuroplasticity and the the, the thinking aspects concept like we have to be more embodied and grounded within ourselves um otherwise i don't think we're going to survive and make good decisions collectively as a species yeah i totally agree moving into this softer space is really important um and it also i think the title also speaks to where we're at uh in the psychedelic research field a bit um yeah, like one thing I really want to mention or highlight is that um, I kind of get the feeling that this is where this is where the science is going next, like studying brain body interactions under psychedelics and what's going on there. And there's a really exciting paper that just came out. It's a preprint at the moment, uh, but this is Fernando Rosas at Imperial College London. Um, he's the the lead author on the paper, but also part of the team are Robin Carhart Harris and Sarah Garfinkel, who are the world's leading experts in psychedelic science and interoception. And the paper uh, is called The Entropic Heart, which is kind of building off of ah. the Entropic Brain paper from several years back. Uh, and it basically shows that um, psychedelics increase heart rate variability uh, and heart rate at the same time, which is very, very unique. Uh, it's a very unique cardiac profile, um, and that's correlated with, with what's going on in the brain. Um, and it's cool because it suggests that possibly um, the heart could be driving psychedelic states to some degree, not just responding um, to what's going on in the brain. And that needs to be tested further. But yeah, it's a very exciting paper. <laughs> I think not many people have been talking about it yet, but um, it's one of the first pieces of work I've seen that ties the two fields together. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I hadn't heard of that saga. And I think on a literal level, we're talking about, you know, the heart as an organ. But yeah, I think metaphorically and metaphysically, the heart, you know, the emotions and, and embodiment, kind of moving more into that feminine paradigm as well, just to bring that back into it. I think, yeah, um, it works on, on both those levels. Um, what other research kind of really stood out to you? Or what other interviews that you did from the book really helped you, you kind of, yeah, anchor that passion that you've got for this area? Hmm. Um, so two researchers I spoke to pretty early on are Karen Dobkins and Andy Arnold. Uh, Karen is a neuroscientist at UC San Diego, 
Andy is a neuroscientist at Royal Holloway, University of London. And yeah, I had some early conversations with them in 2020 that just got me hooked on the subject. And uh, they had put together a paper focused on social interoception, which was really interesting to me. And um, one of their kind of... uh, one part of the of the paper that was really interesting to me was this idea of attentional switching or flexible switching um, in a social situation where you're paying attention to your internal bodily signals um, at the same time as kind of noticing, you know, the facial expressions and body language of another person and kind of, you know, feeling into their experience a bit, um, but doing it in a way where it's kind of a back and forth sort of attentional switching because it can be really easy to sort of get completely caught up in your experience and be focused on that to the point where you're not paying attention to the person across from you or the opposite where you're just total external attention um, to the point where you forget about your internal experience. So I loved that they outlined this as a practice, um, which I found very helpful myself. And yeah, the two of them, I would say, are really like pioneering in this area of applying interception in a social context. Um, so I, I loved speaking with, with both of them. Yeah, and I'm, I'm wondering if there's much that we know already around the different ways that certain drugs, psychedelics, impact the you know our mind-body relationship um, more than others or differently to others, like cannabis, MDMA, psilocybin, uh, to what extent they have different profiles and correlations around you know our, our interception and and um, yeah, just that causality. Do do we know n- enough yet in the research? I don't think we know enough yet. Um, There's a handful of studies that are specifically focused on psychedelic substances and interoception. Not a lot. Um, I think Matthew Johnson had a study in 2015 that was um, about salvia and body trust. It showed that in moderate doses, salvia can enhance body trust. I think it was a small, small study. Um, I think Leiden University in the Netherlands has also studied interoception and microdosing. Um, but I, th- I think we know a lot more intuitively um, and just like experientially and through, yeah, through uh, somatic therapy than we do kind of in a formal interoception research context. I think it's, it's about to begin. So, yeah, I think people are familiar with kind of the ways in which different compounds can uh, influence the bodily self, so to speak. And it's a really interesting idea that that in and of itself, like the modulation of your body or your experience of your body or how the body is represented by the brain, um, if that maps on to therapeutic outcomes, if that's part of what's so beneficial about these compounds. Um, You know, not just changing neural pathways in the brain, but but actually giving you a different experience of yourself as an embodied organism in the world. I think this is a really interesting area to look into. And I think we're on the edge of that. Amazing, yeah. And it would be fascinating to know how how the signals are uh, sent out and dispersed through the body, you know, once someone is using psychedelics. Like through which system does that signal go? You know, is it the vascular system, is it the kind of nervous system, endocrine system? And I'm very interested in, in the endocannabinoid system, which, I, you know, I've, I've just heard a bit about and studied a bit about. And it just fascinates me. And I had an experience a month ago. I had a stomach ache um, and it was really quite painful. So I had some cannabis and it enabled me to isolate the pain just in my stomach. Like, ah, there's the pain, like, there it is, I could isolate it. 
and kind of really just feel around and get to know it and become more aware of its its shape, its intensity. And then the cannabis enabled the rest of my body to just let go of the residual secondary pain that it was absorbing from that pain in my stomach. And so prior to having the cannabis, I didn't notice that the pain was kind of absorbed in my body and just holding it into my body. And the cannabis enabled my body just to almost like shake it off and release it and just let it go, let it go. And then I could just be with the actual pain itself in a more uh, accepting way. Okay, there you are, pain. I'm with you now. And all the other pain that was just all over my body, my shoulders, my arms, my legs, I could let go of that. And so I wasn't feeling so like, ah, uh, pissed off and upset about it. And so that was really just a beautiful moment of feeling into it. And it helped me understand, you know, where trauma lives in our body as well. And why perhaps MDMA in particular is, is a really great medicine for helping us to kind of, you know, melt into the body and, and isolate some of those feelings and for some of those yeah, traumatic memories and imprints to rise to the surface. And even some intergenerational imprints also uh, to rise to the surface as well. So, yeah, I'm not sure what some of your feelings are around these subjects, but I'd love to hear yeah, anything that's coming up for you, Saga. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's really interesting. Um, and I think, I mean, there has been some research on MDMA and the interoceptive network, which the main hub in that network is the insular cortex, which is... Um, kind of hidden in this fissure in the brain. It's a little bit difficult to get to, uh, to, to access and study. Um, but yeah, I mean, anything that kind of alters awareness of the body in a way is, is activating that network and the insular cortex. So yeah, I mean, it needs to be studied further, but I feel like MDMA, you know, being an intactogen and pathogen um, must activate that network. And I've also heard cannabis kind of uh, related to like the proprioceptive network as well. So like your sense of your body in space um, can change as well. Yeah, one thing I would add to that would be that there's this idea of the minimal self versus the narrative self, which I think is really important. Um, this is kind of from philosophy and cognitive science, but becoming relevant to psychedelic science. So the minimal self is kind of just your basic feeling of being in a body, uh, not ne necessarily tied to your identity. And the narrative self is like the story you tell yourself, um, who you are when you wake up in the morning. Uh, all of your memories and kind of your life story. And yeah, um, it seems that there's something going on with psychedelics where the minimal self kind of, its influence sort of traverses over the narrative self. And we kind of get a, you know, an opportunity to be re-embodied in a way, like in a similar way to what you were describing with your pain um, and cannabis experience, like sort of, uh, yeah, like opening up this possibility space of, of like expanding, you know, this very basic sense of being embodied in a way that allows you to then, you know, expand kind of the larger narrative. Um, yeah, and Katrin Preller had a really interesting study that came out on LSD. I think this was 2022, where they actually did show like a connectivity change um, where instead of the direction being like more influence of the default mode network over the salience network, the directionality was switched so that the salience network um, which is tied to the minimal self had more of an influence over the default mode network um, and the narrative self. So there is kind of, yeah, there's some sort of really interesting switch that's happening where we're almost uh, reconnected with this like primal embodied kind of state in a way that, that allows us to change the story as well. 
it's great that you're into the neuroscience and the kind of embodiment science as well, both. Um, yeah, because I think a lot of us are into one, but not both. And uh, yeah, it's really helpful to have someone that can kind of have a foot in both worlds, because ultimately they, 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 it is just one world, but it's really useful that, that you're able to kind of speak both languages and unify them. Thank you. I do my best. Also, just uh, like a science journalist, communicator, definitely not a neuroscientist, not claiming to know, to have expertise um, uh, on everything. But yeah, to the extent that I can, like I love researching and communicating um, what I find. Yeah. And that, that goes in with yeah, like what you're saying, being a journalist and researcher and the, the initial work that you were doing, you know, how to talk about and educate around science. And I know Imran Khan um, at Berkeley, um, you know, his initial uh, work was around kind of scientific education and communication and messaging. Um, and I think it's, it's really important, particularly around psychedelics, just to dispel some myths and stigma um, and just to be really clear about, uh, yeah, the potential here, not to be too hype fueled, but also not too stigma held back to get it kind of just right, the Goldilocks um, the space. And speaking of spaces, you mentioned the possibility space there, Saga, and in your book, uh, that seemed like quite a big deal. So I'd love to really focus on that a little bit, the possibility space. If you could just, yeah, define what you mean by that and why it's relevant um, and what that opens up um, around these processes that we're talking about so far. Yeah, I mean, it sounds very abstract, but um, I think it's it's pretty crucial and interesting. And it comes from the theory of predictive coding, which is it's kind of one of the most widely accepted uh, theories of brain function, which basically states that uh, the brain evolved to, to predict um, a reliable model of the world and um yeah we're we're kind of designed to make predictions and be as right as possible uh about perception and the world that we're in um for survival purposes and so this is a good thing it's adaptive but also too much prediction in the wrong direction can be an issue so like someone who is suffering from depression and kind of a lot of rumination and this inescapable kind of loop of thoughts. Um, you could see this as too much prediction of, you know, how the world is going to be when they wake up in the morning, they know everything. It's, you know, hyper predictable. Um, and what psychedelics can do, and also, in my opinion, embodiment in general, is open up that, that possibility space of updating the the predictive model. So exposing yourself to different ways of perceiving and being in the world. Um, and yeah, I think that's something that, that psychedelics can be really powerful for. Um, and also just connecting to the body uh, on a very basic, basic level of like, just being in touch with sensations reconnecting very basically with sensations and this minimal self I was talking about, I think this can be a gateway into expanding that possibility space. Beautiful. Yeah. And I guess that possibility space is kind of like the entropic brain, entropic heart and the snaking of the sh snow globe. Um, and yeah, being able to really look at and feel into what do I need right now? and now being a unique moment in, in time, rather than just doing what I've always done before and kind of just being in a habitualized kind of rote reality, really seeing that, yep, there's a possibility space right now to react to my kids in a new way, in a different way, or to kind of sit with this feeling that I've got coming up inside of me um, by feeling it a little bit more before I react from that surface level um, experience. So there's quite a lot of, yeah. I think, interrelational, um, kind of social uh, potential here with the possibility space about how 
how we are within ourselves, our own relationship to self and body, but, but also, yeah, relationships with others and um, yeah, interactions in a kind of social cultural way. I think it's somewhat radical as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's, it's really relevant to self-regulation, emotion regulation, interpersonal interaction. Um, yeah, like, like you suggested, I mean, being able to kind of slow down and sort of press pause when something arises for you um, on a physical level before it becomes like a full-blown state of being or a full-blown emotional state, which then moves you into behavior really quickly, right? Like being able to really slow down um, and notice those bodily sensations. I mean, that just expands this possibility space enormously, right? Like once you slow down and press pause, then suddenly you have all of this space to respond differently from. Um, yeah, and I've, I've experimented with that myself. I've found it hugely helpful. Um, it's also related to the psychologist William James, like his, his theory uh, that basically like um, bodily signals precede emotion. So it's sort of our subjective appraisal of a physical signal that allows for, for an emotion, you know, construct of an emotion to arise at all instead of, uh, you know, the brain having an experience and the body reacting to it. It can actually be the other way around where we have the physical feeling, the physical experience first. And it's really just our interpretation of that physical experience that creates the emotion state. So, I mean, for me, yeah, like I would say ketamine has been very instructive in that way. Um, I've had experiences where I've been able to just slow down and um, kind of separate the bodily sensation from the emotion state in a way that I wasn't able to before. And that has been really quite easy to integrate actually into my daily life and has been hugely helpful uh, for myself, for self-regulation, but also, um, yeah, in relationships too. Beautiful. And I think, yeah, you've mentioned a few times the trust of the body for the body and that it's a ongoing relationship and being tuned in whatever's going on no matter how mundane and even if it's a blank slate just always being tuned in and i guess what that means is if we're always tuned in to our body aware of it like in relationship with it then it always comes first you know because we're, we're kind of perpetually there like it's it's our experience of life as a body being embodied and then as thoughts come and go they're coming and going kind of with that kind of background yeah attuning to the body which is, yeah, just I think a really great way of life to have. And it makes me feel into, gosh, this is super important for for all of life, but particularly for the integration aspect of psychedelic uh, experiences, um, of how to translate our experiences into meaningful changes or just into meaningful experiences of, of life without having to be tripping and being high. That's where, yeah, our body and being in our body is really, really key. And if we're chasing medicine, it means I think we're not really that embodied or what our body is trying to tell us, we're perhaps not able to uh, listen to sufficiently. So I think, yeah, this is super important, particularly for the integration piece. I'm not sure if that is much you've covered in the book or you're also interested in potentially. Mm, yeah, that's a great point. Um, I don't go into integration so much in the book, but I definitely... Yeah, I mean, I, I quote Rick Doblin at the beginning saying that sort of, you know, the, the point of taking psychedelics is to get to a, a state of mind where you don't need to take psychedelics anymore. Um, so that spirit is very much in, infused throughout the book and connecting to this inner healer um, and just really believing in and embodying this wisdom from within. I think it can help like you're saying with integration, but also 
um, preparation. Uh, I think this is this is also, you know, at least people I've spoken to who are facilitators and guides, um, really emphasize the importance of learning to co- connect with your body interoceptively before you enter into a retreat or a ceremony um, or any kind of psychedelic experience. So I think. I think that can just add a layer of safety or potential harm reduction, actually, uh, if you if you put that piece in, in place beforehand. Um, yeah, and sort of, yeah, really like drive home the point that the body is home, you're grounded, you're safe, you can always return to this place. Um, yeah, I think that could be really, really useful in all stages of the journey. Yeah, hundred percent. I love that emphasis on harm reduction. Um, awesome. Uh, and I don't know if you interviewed folks, therapists that are experts in Hakomi or somatic experiencing SE, but that's you know definitely something that's really popular in the kind of psychedelic therapy space um, around helping clients to or people to yeah develop that interoceptive relationship with their body and to kind of, yeah, be able to tune in before, during and after and really give voice and expression to what it is that is happening um, through the medicine. So I don't know, have you looked into those those and any other kind of more somatic focused uh, techniques that specialize in that area? Yeah, um, at the end of the book, there's a list of practices which include Hakomi and somatic experiencing, Feldenkrais, kind of most of the mainstream practices that anyone kind of familiar with somatics would know. Um, I would say one person I interviewed who's not actually a psychedelic therapist, uh, but had some very interesting ideas about embodiment that could be applied to psychedelics is Kelsey Blackwell. She's a cultural somatics practitioner in Oakland. And she talks about kind of opening yourself up to the greater complexity of what's happening in a moment when you're kind of um, swept up in a a challenging experience or a a challenging feeling or a challenging emotion and just remembering that widening your view and you know, feeling your feet on the ground, um, your legs in the chair, reminding yourself that there's more going on. You are more than, you know, one facet of your experience. And acting from that place is is an act of authenticity. Um, and I really, yeah, I really love the way she gives voice to some of these practices. So I would recommend looking at her interview for some, yeah, some pointers in terms of facilitating psychedelic journeys. And I'll say that, you know, it was sort of deliberate on my part to interview people from a wide variety of fields, like not just psychedelic therapists, not just guides, but people from developmental psychology, from somatics, neuroscientists, in order to like plant these seeds of you know, potential cross-pollination um, across the different fields and disciplines. And so I asked a lot of these people about psychedelics, even though they're not psychedelic scientists or guides. And I did that deliberately because I wanted to kind of, you know, let the creativity flow a little bit and create this kind of breeding ground for more ideas um, from different different fields. So yeah, I think there's some really interesting things, uh, threads to pull on from just different disciplines in the book that could be used in the psychedelic field. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, I love that it's it's not essentially a book about psychedelics, it, but psychedelics is kind of threaded through it and it's uh, it brings disciplines together, which is exactly what we're talking about. It's, yeah, that kind of mind-body being piece. And there was one piece that I, I'm really interested in. I don't know if it, if it came up in the book saga around nature and you know there's a part of the kind of psychedelic uh 
perspective that focuses around nature relatedness, nature connectedness, and that could be something like forest bathing, hiking, um, you know, swimming, you know, I think you know, animals, equine therapy, just that kind of nature aspect of life, not being just stuck in a, an urban um, kind of lifestyle setting. So to what extent are you interested in that piece or feeling that's part of kind of our interoceptive uh, potential and the possibility space is to be in nature when we're kind of opening that space up? Well, on a personal level, it's I think it's huge. There's huge potential there. And I'm someone who's very connected to nature. I grew up in one of the most beautiful parts of the world, just a little bit biased, but not not much. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I have a very embodied experience firsthand of appreciating nature. Um, and I think I've, I've come to the point where I don't see, I don't see a separation between, um, a place of calmness within my body and the peace of the natural world it's the same quality to me. So, you know, if I'm standing looking up at the stars at night in some beautiful remote place, that resonates inside me because it it's the same quality, if that makes sense. You know, I feel it in my body so profoundly because it's like a reminder that my body is, is part of this greater, um, you know, profound stillness. And yeah, I mean, I think that's so powerful. That's one of the most powerful um, resources that we have access to for our own well-being. So let's protect it, you know. <laughs> um, and in that interview, I mean, it's it's very sciencey. I would say uh, it's with someone who is. Um, she studies sort of the meaning making process around connecting with nature and her name is Evie Peterson. Um, and she, she basically studies, you know, the, the way that we create meaning, um, including being in nature and yeah, and says that, uh, we can sort of relate to nature in a similar way that we relate to each other um, because meaningful emotions are kind of a construct anyway. So it really doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter what we're connecting to as long as we're connecting to it in a way that's meaningful for us. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that interview was fantastic for me to do and I really connect with that, that topic as well. Thank you for asking about it. Yeah, and I think it, you know, it's coming back to that possibility space as well, just being really open to, you know, the possibility of, of learning new things. And and again and again in the book, you talk about disconnection versus connection. And it's so empowering that what you were just saying as well, you know, to be connected to nature, to the universe, to our world, like we are part of it. Like it is us, we are it. Like it is one experience when we can experience that. And um, and we kind of, I think, need really need that right now. So um, beautifully done. I've got one more question, Saga, around just generally, what was it like writing a book? Like you, you put a lot of work into it. Like you interviewed loads of people. There's a lot of pages there. Dense theory, personal experience. Um, what was it like kind of pitching it to publishers? And, and yeah, what was the experience of working with Synergetic Press like as well? Just really interested in, yeah, some takeaways from that experience looking back. Yeah, well, first of all, I'll just say working with Synergetic was fantastic, and I'm so lucky uh, to have had them connect with it um, and pick it up. It was completely amazing, and I love that team. So perfect fit. Very happy with that experience. And, yeah, I mean, the experience of writing the book I've wanted to write a book since I was a kid. That's been a bucket list item to me. Um, Check. But yeah, right. <laughs> but th the way this came about was not like sitting down, deciding I'm going to write a book, typing it away. It was not like that at all. It was, and, and I think 
that's how it had to be for it to actually turn out the way that it is. Um, it was more like, wow, I found this amazing thread, this line of research, this idea, this these people um, who are passionate about this subject. And yeah, like I said, it, it was an article at first and then it just built and built and built uh, a lot of momentum became a series of essays, uh, which I then strung together. And during 2020, I interviewed most of the people uh, in the connection section of the book. And of course, that was 2020. So you can guess what that experience was like, a lot of zooming. Um, and it was really special. Like it was, it was special to write it during that time, because here we were in this period of disconnection and connection just happened to be on my mind at the time. Um, but it was also just a really, yeah, like profound time to be investigating this topic. And I'm still kind of, you know, processing what I've learned from it. There's so much, um, but I'm, I'm very grateful to the people who were involved in it, the people uh, who are studying these topics and contributing to the research, I think, yeah, like I, I owe them a great debt. Um, so I would say the best part was, was literally the connection with the people, uh, who are doing this great work for me. Mm. Yeah. I love that you fulfilled that dream and that it happened kind of organically, maybe accidentally, but it just kind of organically grew and evolved from like the top, from the bottom up, not the top down, but the bottom up, like really just yeah. going and following that curiosity and passion. And yeah, I, I really like Synergetic Press as well. Jasmine Verdi um, is part of the team and she's one of our teachers here. And um, yeah, I just, I just love that the, the things that people are expressing are, are just, they're just such beautiful creations. Um, and a book is a, yeah, is an act of creation. So thank you for creating something so um, amazing that's always going to be here. And, and I hope will help a lot of people um, to be, um, yeah, embodied again um, and collectively to move forward in a beautiful direction. Thank you, Saga. Thank you, David. I really appreciate that. Yeah. It's a passion uh, of mine and it's, it's, I'm so grateful to be able to share it. Um, with anyone who resonates with it mm. yeah oh, it's great to see when someone connects with anything that just brings that excitement and passion and and meaning like this is important and i'm I've, i'm going to be i've got to go down this path that's just beautiful to see and um yeah uh so I'd, I'd love to ask you to tell folks that are feeling that desire to read your book and to find out more about your work and who you are where should they go to uh, to find out more saga yeah, so you can go directly to the Synergetic Press website and order it there. Um, you can also just hit up your local indie bookstore and order it directly from them. Um, and you can access it through Amazon um, if that's that's your only option. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I would recommend going to Synergetic Press and, and finding a copy there. Yeah, beautiful. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you again for your work. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing um, what happens next with, with your uh, yeah, evolution and growth. But beautiful to have you on the show. Thanks, Saga. Thank you, David. It's been a pleasure. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed uh, this episode. Lots of love. God bless. <laughs>